Today, we return to the problem of racism against Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic. We do so through the lens of the award-winning feature film, Stateless, the latest documentary by the Emmy-nominated and Sundance-winning director, Michelle Stevenson. Stateless examines race ideology and contemporary race politics in both Haiti and the Dominican Republic, And the film is without description, really. I watched a good part of it last night, and it doesn't really feel like a documentary. It feels more like a feature-length narrative movie. That's like a Hollywood movie. That's what narrative movie means. But, but of course, it was not made by Hollywood, so it has a completely different feel. Um, And it was made in a different land. Uh, The film develops against the backdrop of attempts at the extermination of Haitians during the 1937 Haitian genocide by the Dominican military, which claimed the lives of tens of thousands of Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent. The film also develops in the context of Law 16813, passed in 2013 in the Dominican Republic, which established that only Persons born in the Dominican Republic to Dominican parents or legal residents can be considered citizens. The draconian immigration law canceled the citizenship of 200,000 people whose parents and grandparents the law identified as undocumented. And these are people who've been living in the Dominican Republic since 1929. It's a denationalization of people who had been considered Dominican during all of their lifetime, uh, many of whom were registered at birth as Dominican nationals and who throughout their lives had been granted other identity documents such as identity cards, electoral ID cards, and passports. The film is screening now at the Tribeca Film Festival, and it will premiere on PBS's acclaimed documentary series, POV, on July 19th. And here to talk to us about it this morning, we welcome back to the show the film director, Michelle Stevenson. Michelle Stevenson is a filmmaker, artist, and author. She tells compelling, deeply personal stories that are created by, for, and about communities of color. Uh, And her object is to reimagine and provoke. Her feature documentary, American Promise, was nominated for three Emmys and won the jury prize at Sundance. Her most recent feature, this one we're going to be talking about this morning, Stateless, is nominated for a Canadian Screen Award and is playing at this year's Tribeca Film Festival ahead of its national broadcast release on PBS's POV on July 19th. We're bringing her back because we all want you to watch PBS's POV and watch this powerful documentary on on July 19th. Michelle Stevenson, welcome back to A New Day. Thank you so much for having me back. So I watched this film, or a good part of it, uh, last night, and... And it is really beautifully rendered. Uh, it, its images are are stunning, and it's engulfing. Like I was, I was with the protagonist every step of the way, Rosaides, who's a Dominican of Haitian descent, a few generations removed, who is fighting as an attorney to to get uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent descent their papers so that they can so that they can belong to society and we don't really understand the extent to which papers are important in society but they're important for everything to work to go to school um, to go to the hospital probably so we can't uh, overestimate or overemphasize what it means to have no papers in a country. Uh, and we have our own paperless problem here. Uh, 
no papers problem because of our own immigration policy. But I'll say this, one of the most, one of the most um, touching moments for me in this film was when Rosaides, the protagonist, goes to Haiti, a place she's never been to. This is a Dominican of Haitian descent. She goes to Haiti because her cousin was um, is stateless in the Dominican Republic, who's like her, speaks Spanish just like her, like I do. I'm Dominican, by the way. Um, a Dominican American. Uh, and what he decides to do is that he goes, he's like, all right, y'all don't want me here. I'm going to Haiti. I'm, I'm going to the, a country I don't know, but it's my it's my people's country. And the exchange between Rosaides and her Dominican cousin is oh is very touching. Can you tell us about about that moment and what he says? Um, sure. I think <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, so um, Rosa's father was actually was Haitian. He he passed away. And so, but again, she had never been on in that, she'd never been to the land. So, and I think for me, what was really important, um, actually Rosaides is the one who really encouraged us to uh, work with Teofilo and cover his story. Because for her, his situation is the most egregious, is, 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 is an extreme in terms of the level of egregiousness that he finds himself in. Um, uh, Teofilo, her cousin, um, born in the DR, mother is Dominican. Um, he basically from one day to the next loses his papers. And we see um, in the next scene after she, uh, they greet each other with such warmth because they kind of grew up together uh, uh, in the Bates in, in, in the DR in, uh, in San Pedro de Marco Iris. And so um, what we see is a man who's able to bring his passport. He has actually traveled to Germany and to Europe. He uh, he was able to get passports for his children. Um, he has records of his voter registration. He basically has this huge documentation. He's someone who's kept all his papers. He was a businessman. Um, he did work with uh, with phones and and um, and had his own business. Um, and all of that was disintegrated uh, uh, for him from one day to the next. And so for her, I think reuniting with him, I think there are two things. One is her love for her cousin um, and seeing him and wanting to help him. But they both have in their imaginary what Haiti signifies for them that um, – that is so contrary to the stereotypes that exist about the country. And that's for me what I felt was really important to sort of reveal this idea that Haiti can also represent um, a symbol of liberation, right? A symbol of black liberation, a symbol where potentially freedom could happen. And for me, Teofilo is sort of this modern day maroon. He leaves for Haiti, not as a refugee, but really as a person seeking liberation from oppression, right? Seeking the mountains of Haiti that have this symbol of, 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 of maroon societies that have existed uh, over the centuries and this idea of resistance. And so that's one thing on the one hand. And then Rosa, for her, she had a very special relationship with her father. And the idea that she's on the, the, that land of her ancestors just brings her so much joy. It, her spontaneity was just, we were really fortunate to be able to capture that and to capture a people's love for a country and what it means symbolically and sort of countering a lot of the, per, well, the perceptions that exist uh, uh, regarding um, Haiti. So th it was an extremely important and touching moment. And I've not been to Haiti, although I've wanted to go. And in fact, I've, I wanted to go with my father, who who's no longer with us. Uh, he went there with um, my brother. We're, we're Dominican. Um, but my, my father went to Haiti. And, um, and for me, seeing Haiti in your film is beautiful because it's so it's the same island for god's sake 
as the Dominican Republic. Um, but, but those m- moments you captured of Haiti, uh, of the land, are, are just moments of dignity, are moments of dignity for Haiti. Um, a people uh, who've, been, who've been persecuted by Europe uh, for, for the valiant determination to seek freedom as enslaved Africans, right? Uh, and, I, and I think that, that that's really the award-winning film right here, I think. Everything you said is exactly what what uh, I hoped you would articulate that that upon becoming stateless, Teofilio seeks refuge and freedom in this uh, incredibly important country uh, in this project of uh, freedom seeking in the Americas. Um, so, so thank you so much for gifting us with that, with that moment, with that. I, I want to know Teofilio. I want, I want to know who he is. I want to go interview him and have a conversation with him. He's such uh, a beautiful human being. You can just sense it from, from just his presence uh, on stage, if you will. Um, but, but it seems that. I don't know his story, but it seems that he was uh, he was cut to size precisely by by Dominican authorities precisely because of his of his sense of personhood and self. Yeah, that's definitely all wrapped up in there uh, uh, for sure. And I think what's interesting as we look at you know, the trajectory of Rosaides and the decisions that she makes versus Teofilo and the decisions that he makes, there's a bit of a clash of worldviews. I mean, they're not in conflict, but they both make different decisions around what the systemic uh, racism and neoliberalism, as you mentioned, sort of faces for them. And he has sort of opted out of the system in some ways. He goes along with Rosaides' sort of still sort of hope for gaining some kind of recognition, some kind of belonging that the system can offer, um, um, but it doesn't have complete faith in it because of all of the the hard knocks that he's received uh, with the system. And so it's sort of interesting to see their two worldviews as they kind of have these conversations about their relationship to, to the DR and to Haiti. There's also one thing you mentioned just in terms of it being just one island. I think there's one thing that's for me, significant in that the the border in some ways is imaginary. It's really a state, (laughs) a state imposed notion of division. Um, When you go to the border, you see how, how porous it is and how there's actually, you know, what they call this border culture that exists across, uh, uh, across the both sides. And in some ways, the island is more of a continuum rather than this, you know, harsh reality that, you know, the, the state is uh, trying to impose, that there's more fluidity between people across that. Um, but yes, with regards to Teofilo, he, you know, um, like I say, he was a, um, he was making do, you know, um, an educated man who was making his own business in this small town. Um, and, um, you know, he had uh, Dominican neighbors who were revengeful, you know, and reported him. And and when he had to go renew his um, his passport, um, that's when all of sort of the things started and the law was imposed on him, the decision was imposed on him and he could not renew anything. He could no longer travel. Um, he could no longer work. He could no longer um, um, register his business in the way that he was supposed to and, um, and, and, lost, and, and lost everything. Hmm. Tell us a little more about the things he lost before we move to the next question. But before you do, you're listening to the voice of Emmy-nominated and Sundance-winning director Michelle Stevenson. And we're talking about her latest film, Stateless, an award-winning documentary film that examines the complex racial histories and complex politics of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Stateless is playing at this year's Tribeca Film Festival ahead of its national broadcast release on PBS's POV 
on July 19th. And I'm Johanna Fernandez, your host of A New Day, and you're listening to WBAI at 99.5 FM in New York. Tell us more about what Teofilo lost. Well, I think the biggest item, I don't know for people who understand, you know, in, 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 in the DR and actually in many countries, you can't really um, um, circulate without a proper ID. Well, quote unquote, proper ID, cedula. Um, that is updated because they could round you up, put you in jail, any kind of thing. You're, you're just vulnerable um, to authorities. And um, um, going to uh, the government office to to renew, they imposed you know the, the decision and the law that he had. He needed to bring legitimate papers to prove that his mother uh, was Dominican because there was one error in her uh, in her uh, death certificate, and so. Uh, he wasn't able to do that in the moment because it costs money. Um, and so he, he lost his ID, his ID card. He no longer could, could, uh, register. He lost his ability to get a, a, a cell phone. He had to depend on other people to get cell phone service for him. Um, he had to close down his business. Um, and, uh, he ultimately was married to a Dominican woman of Dominican descent. Um, they divorced, they ended up divorcing and she, uh, stayed with the children and he, he ended up deciding that he couldn't take the discrimination anymore, the lack of belonging, the invisibility and decided to, to try his fate, um, in Haiti. And so when we meet him in Haiti, he's being surrounded and supported by a distant, um, uh, relative, um, uh, in Belladere. And um, who's trying to help him, you know, find some work there. And uh, when we meet him, he's actually sort of selling uh, what they call uh, minutes, uh, um, uh, cell phone minutes um, hmm. to to people. And uh, that's how he's sort of making ends meet at the moment. And I think uh, Rosa, for her, she it was very it's very painful for her to see, you know, his basic his um, um his debacle, like his, his, his complete sort of uh, loss of everything. And she feels really motivated to see how she can help him. Because one thing that, uh, when the ruling came down by the court, you know, there was so much uproar internationally for a brief moment, because now we don't hear at all about what's going on. And actually the situation is worse today than it was back then in many ways. Um, the government was forced to provide these different avenues for getting some sort of registration so people could at least sort of at least, you know, uh, continue to work people who had birth certificates. And so she feels that there's a way for her to help him. Um, and so in the film, we see some of the efforts. And to this day, um, his status is still um, in limbo. Um, we've helped the lawyers that he's rep that are representing him to see if they could sort of at least bring in the papers that they say he needs. Um, and every time they go, they provide the paper that they've asked for with regards to, you know, recognizing that the mother was Dominican. Um, and then they give another hurdle. Mm. And it's just it's 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 very, very expensive. It's hundreds and hundreds of dollars um, to get this uh, these um to get the requirements met. And it's cruel. And it's cruel. It's expensive and it's 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 cruel. Uh it's cruel abuse. Dehumanizing, you know, it's dehumanizing to be in front of a bureaucrat who doesn't really see you and doesn't right. want to help and doesn't want to really tell you what the rules are. Um and uh we were able to reveal some of that through the hidden camera uh, work that, uh, you know, Teofilo and Rosa also agreed to, um, in the government offices. And, and all of this, you know, bureaucracy in the Dominican Republic is, is a remnant of the, of the dictatorship of Trujillo. I imagine, I haven't, I, I'm a historian, but I, I, I'm not a historian of Dominican history. But all of these burdens that, having to carry a cedula around it's um it's a remnant of trujillo's neo-nazi if you will regime in uh 
on that island, and Trujillo was, of, of course, uh, one of the longest-standing dictators in the in the in Latin America, who was propped up by the American government. So, for folks who are not familiar with uh, race ideology in the Dominican Republic, how do you explain this to them? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, so I think, well, a couple of things. I mean, um, I sort of think of it as when you think about just that island, because I want to say that Haiti is not immune from the race ideology as, 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 uh, as African as we like to, you know, uh, claim ourselves. We do also have a racial caste system that is pretty alive and well along, you know, uh, um, color, uh, uh, color lines. And I think, how do we explain it? I mean, it, it's complicated and not at the same time, you know, um, our, our racial capitalism and um, the legacy of colonialism and slavery, um, you know, all happened on that island. You know, the first Europeans arrived uh, uh, on Hispaniola. The first Africans arrived on Hispaniola. The first genocide against indigenous peoples happened on that island. And um, the pigmentocracy was established quite well by the French and the Spanish. And that's, the, the, those, that's what we're seeing today in terms of the legacy of that. And on one side of the island, this claim of liberation, this claim of our blackness, this claiming of, 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 of African roots, um, there was a huge price to be paid um, as a result. And the other side of the island, in some ways, if you look at it, it's the flip side of it, right? It's not even seeing oneself in the mirror and the denial at all costs of the African roots, understanding that white supremacy, you know, reigns and the lighter we are, um, um, the better access we have. Um, and there's a cognitive dissonance uh, that continues to exist on the island. And Trujillo is sort of the prime example. I mean, the big folklore is that his grandmother was Haitian, right? Um, so his roots are not far, uh, as, uh, as with many Dominicans. I mean, it is an island. Um, where, again, as I was saying, you know, in exchange has happened throughout history. And, you know, the, the, the folklore also is that he powdered his face to seem um, a lighter. And um, one more thing I want to say is that the U.S. occupation also was a huge factor um, in the influence of, of uh, instilling even deeper sort of um, anti-blackness. Um, if we look at the the practices of the military, the U.S. military, it was you know our the the southern white military officers who occupied the period, and to see how um, how our people were depicted um, is um, is very painful. But there is a legacy of that encounter as well that Trujillo sort of um, embodied as well. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, Trujillo is not the only. I mean, we've had many dictators in Haiti as well. Um, so it's complicated. It's complicated. Um, yeah. I want to invite our listening audience to join us in this conversation. We're talking to the Emmy-nominated and Sundance-winning director, Michelle Stevenson, about her latest film, Stateless, which is about the uh, statelessness of Dominicans of Haitian descent in uh, the island of Hispaniola in the Dominican Republic in particular. And uh, Stateless is playing at this year's Tribeca Film Festival ahead of its national broadcast release on, POV, on, on PBS's POV. And that's happening on July 19th. And I'm Johanna Fernandez, your host of A New Day. You're listening to WBAI at 99.5 FM in New York. And the call-in number is 212-209-2877. 212-209-2877. And we had hoped for Dr. Edward Paulino to be here with us. Um, Dr. Edward Paulino is Associate Professor of the Department of Global History at John Jay and the author of Dividing Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic's Border Campaign Against Haiti, 1930-1961. to 
Uh, but I caught him very late last night, and uh, I want to play a clip of uh, the conversation I had with him. I asked him the exact same question I asked you. Uh, and once again, I'd like to bring in our listening audience while we listen. The number to call is 212-209-2877, 212-209-2877. Two eight seven seven. But before, let's listen to Dr. Paulino's response to the question: um, How do you explain this insanity to people outside the island? How would you explain this conflict or this crisis tragedy to people who are not familiar with Dominican politics? I think well, partly it's um you see this around the world it's uh an issue that the elites use to mobilize political support to obfuscate or evade attention to the real problems which are economics corruption uh, the failure of the state to provide real and decent services for for their citizens. And so they create the boogeyman, use the Haitians and their descendants as a scapegoat, and they have a large reservoir or archive of, you know, a wellspring to draw upon. Okay, we've got callers. Caller, you're on the line. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Jose Enrique, Jose from Belleville? Y yes, Jose, welcome to the show. Okay. Uh, it's fascinating what's going on. But, uh, I mean, from the past to the present, but we have to take in consideration what happened with Clinton, Elian Gonzalez, and the whole community. Because that's when Clinton sent... The, poli the police in Haiti to be trained so the Haitians cannot go through the water but it has to go through Dominican Republic hmm. because he couldn't face another ship full of Haitians here when Elian Gonzalez was here and that aggravated the whole situation between the two countries <gasps> okay so uh the, this is the era of the boat people, the so-called boat people. Um, let's mm -hmm. uh, thank you so very much, Jose, and, and I'll have Michelle respond to that after I take a few more calls. But thank you so very much for joining us this morning. And I know that you're Dominican. Um, we're going to have a conversation, Dominican to Dominican soon. Uh, caller, you're on the line. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, uh, my name's Paul. I'm uh, from Brooklyn, and uh, it doesn't surprise me that there's uh, some, uh, well, for, first of all, friction or cross-border animus. I don't know what else to call it uh, in the island of Hispaniola, um, especially since there is a legacy from the colonizers of uh, white skin supremacy. So, uh, you know, I followed some of uh, both Dominican and Haitian history. Of course, I'm not a, a scholar like you are, but this was uh, my, my take on it since, uh, you know, ever since I was young, I, I, and that's many years ago, <laughs> I, I, I remember actually hearing about there being uh, a, uh, an insurrection, we'll call it, in the capital, in Santo Domingo, and uh, that was in 1965. And I was very young. I was actually just into my teenagerhood. But anyway, uh, it, it, I, I congratulate the filmmaker for her film. I hope that you know it comes off well and gets well received. And I, I would really like to see it. You know, and you know, I. I just just to, to echo something from your previous segment, uh, <laughs> I think that's a, uh, a pee-poor 
uh, example of what the, the ruling class in the United States can do for black people, people of color in general, to to have June nineteenth, Juneteenth, uh, become a national holiday and not uh, go for the uh, the John Lewis Civil Rights Bill and and all those things that would really make a difference and be real progress. Uh, you know, this is like window dressing, really. So, right. Uh, I just wanted to give that comment as well. Thank you so very much, Paul, for joining us this morning. We're going to take another caller. Caller, you're on the line. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Good yeah, morning. My name is Charles from the Bronx. Charles. Good yeah, morning. Good show. It's on the money. She made a lot of good points. I like to say this. If it wasn't for the Haitians, there'll be no America and there'll be no South America. That's a mm-hmm. fact. Because uh, right. once the um, Desaline defeated the, um, the what was the, the Spanish, uh, the French, and whoever came in there, Napoleon had to sell the land from Louisiana Purchase. Mm-hmm. And not only that, one of the Haitian leaders in uh, 18, I think, 40, gave his guns and uh, ammunition to Simone Boulevard, the one that l- liberated uh, Latin America. So if we take the year from uh, 1825 to 2010, the French told the Haitians, that uh, we are not going to forgive you for we lost labor in you. We lost money. So you're going to pay us. So imagine black America. Uh, Juneteenth to me is a joke because a holiday and reparations are totally different, right? They are always uh, running around the bush. As we always know, when slavery ended, they became with the mass incarceration system, which made them more money. Mm. Right? Mass incarceration also said the 13th Amendment, if you are in prison, you are a slave. Until we can close down these, uh, the prison industry in this country and distribute the wealth fairly, we are still enslaved. We are not free. So this bill is not going to free us. So like I was saying, the Haitian people are getting the short end of the stick, and they don't deserve it. There will be no Dominican Republic if it wasn't for the uprising in uh, the 1804. In, in that commemoration speech of the 1804, it welcomed everybody. Charles, so, we've got two more callers. Okay, but thank you. But we really appreciate your, your, your sense of history. Um, caller, you're on the line. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, my name is Joe. I'm calling from New York. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. I think you have to turn down your radio in the background. Okay. Yes. Short, Hello. please. Yes. We're running out of time. Talk to us. Oh, I, yes, I'd just like to say that uh, today, uh, everywhere in the media, you don't hear the words workers or capitalists, only left or right or red and blue states. Because capitalism always tried to eliminate the existence of the working class threat to their power. Now, capitalism always means profit over workers, but communism means the abolition of profit. And, co- and communist revolution is the one and only force in history to ever to stop the imperialists in their tracks, and that's what they're so afraid of. And that's what happened in the Dominican Republic, too. They realized that Haiti was the real threat. To the whole, to the whole world, and not, not only the United States, of working class power and taking away the, uh, their their power to exploit it and destroy us as a, as a people. Joe, thank you so very much uh, for your comments, and to all of our callers, really, who enrich uh, this program tremendously. Michelle, take it away. We've got about three minutes. Um, oh, oh, thank you, everyone, for calling in. I think um, I just have a, a, a couple of points. Uh, um, I think it's the first caller who uh, talked about Clinton and uh, and um, Haitian migrants. This this subject matter is way beyond uh, Clinton. You know, it's it's about 
you know, decades and decades of, of racial capitalism and its practices uh, on the island. And I say on both sides of the uh, island as well. And in this particular case, and I think it's, it's interesting how even with the film, people react and talk about, you know, the, the, the treatment of Haitians. This is not the, just the treatment of Haitians. We're talking about Dominican citizens, people born on the island, the idea of birthright citizenship which exists pretty much all over the Americas. It's part of this new world sort of myth of you don't need to be connected by blood to the land to be of the land. And that's what's been ripped away using uh, a, a race as a device. And just in point, you know, I completely agree with Dr. Paulino in this idea of the elites manipulating, you know, notions, but it's, it's this intersection and use of race and, and and capitalist interests that we are, that we see what is that is being manifested right now uh, on the island that the elites are c- collaborating with each other but using these internalized notions you know that have existed as a legacy uh, of of the racial caste system and so that's what we have to combat we have to use this battle of narratives use alternative narratives I mean we open the session. Uh, we looking at Haiti from a different lens and, and, and kind of spreading the word around that and trying to create, you know, a, a new, new narratives that are, you know, the generations to come can sort of, uh, look at themselves and feel like belonging from a different place and, and, and work from a, a space of dignity in terms of trying to make change. In the Dominican Republic, where the vast majority of people are black, uh, the vast majority of Dominicans are black. Uh, the term black is associated with Haitians. Uh, so it produces what is clearly a psychiatric condition that black people um, don't think of themselves as black because for them to be black is to be Haitian. And so there's an enormous amount of denial um, but this is the harvest of empire. This is the harvest of the project of slavery and colonialism. And there's also a tradition in the Dominican Republic of of people fighting together alongside of Haitians uh, against their imperial and capitalist rulers. You've been listening to the voice of Emmy-nominated and Sundance-winning director, Michelle Stevenson, and we're talking about her latest film, Stateless, an award-winning documentary film that examines the complex racial histories and contemporary politics of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Stateless is playing at this year's Tribeca Film Festival ahead of its national broadcast release on PBS's POV on July 12th. Thank you so very much, Michelle, for this tremendous film. Thank you so much for having me.